Very good morning, everybody. Learning is a pleasure that will follow everywhere. This national level student development program, which offers free online certificate course on effective English language development is organized by VBN Degree College, Bengaluru. VBN Degree College, a unit of VBN Trust, is one of the pioneer institutions in Bengaluru, providing academically excellent value-based education for girl students. Since its inception, Vasavi Vidyaniketan Degree College has pioneered the discipline of commerce. Our objective is to provide quality education to girl students and empower them. The college offers graduation course in commerce and has sustained its glorious track record all through the years. The institute is located in one of the most posh locations of Bangalore, which makes it easily accessible and safe for girl students. BVN Degree College is affiliated to Bengaluru City University and has created an indelible mark for upholding Indian culture and imparting quality education with the techno savvy corporate training programs to enable the students to be confident, responsible citizens with positive thinking and right orientation of mind to face life with all its opportunities and challenges. On this second day of Effective English Language Development online course, I, Prasanna Urpika, the coordinator of this National Student Development Program, am privileged to welcome and introduce today's resource person, Professor Meenakshi NS, who would take up the first session of today from 11 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. She would be speaking on British English and American English. Professor Meenakshi hails from Kundapura, located in South Kendra of Karnataka State. Originally, she belongs to the hill station Madikeri. Madam Meenakshi has done her MA from Mangalore University and also Yampil degrees to her credit. She is a voracious reader and a dedicated teacher. She has participated and presented papers in national and international seminars and conferences. Her specialization field is Indian writing in English. Presently, Professor Meenakshi NS works at Bhandarkar's Arts and Science College, Kundapur. I extend a hearty welcome to Professor Meenakshi. I also extend a warm welcome to all the English learners who have joined this online live YouTube program. I also extend my hearty welcome to the management members, uh, CEA and A, the principal, my colleagues, teachers, and students, the IT coordinator, and all the back support staff members. Over to Professor Meenakshi. Good morning, everybody. I'm grateful to Prasanna Upikar for introducing and welcoming me. I'm also thankful to the principal of VVN Degree College, Professor G. Venugopal, for creating an opportunity to get connected. Today, I'm going to talk on the differences between American and British English. Today, we find individuals all over the world making use of both the British and American English. It is with the invention of computers, American English became widespread. Charles Babbage, an English mechanical engineer, is considered the father of computer because Charles Babbage invented the first mechanical computer in the early 19th century. 
In most of the computers, the dictionary setting is Nova Webster's, and therefore it takes American spelling. Perhaps you might be in the habit of watching American movies and series. If so, it definitely might have exposed you to different sort of intonation, stress, grammar, etc. The BBC News might have exposed you to what is called the British English. Be it the British or the American, what becomes important is to know the language because English is a beautiful language. Indeed, a prestigious language. Let us first understand the importance of learning English. Today, the English language is very useful in our society because we use it in our daily lives. It's the world's lingua franca. Language, English language is used in science, computers, diplomacy, tourism, and so the study of English is very important. You may be wondering, why is there a need to know the difference between British and American English? Whether you know it or not, 50% of you will either visit America or Britain. And so you must definitely know the language and cultural difference between the two. Not knowing the difference between the British English and the American English might lead to confusion or even a sticky situation. Here is a scenario. You learn British English in school, but now you are doing a bit of tourism in New York City. You decide to visit an art museum and you are looking for a painting on the second floor. You go up two escalators only to discover that now you are on the third floor. How did that happen? In the United States, the floor at the same level as the street is usually called the first floor. But in the UK, it's called the ground floor. And the first floor is one above it. Here is another scenario. You studied English in the US and you have made a new friend from Great Britain. You ask him where he went to college and he gives you a strange look. I didn't. I finished secondary school and went straight to university, he says. In the UK, consider, in the UK, secondary school is the general term for what North Americans call college. Now consider a final scenario. You tell your new British friend that you like his pants and you want to know where he got them, he blushes. Your new friend is probably embarrassed because you have just told him that you like his underwear. And if you want to compliment his pants, you should say, I like your trousers. Now, let us understand the history of English language. The history of the English language really started with the, the arrival of three Germanic tribes who invaded Britain during the fifth century AD. Now, take a look at this map. These tribes, the Saxons, the Angles, and the Jews, they traveled from these places to England in 5th century AD. They crossed the North Sea and happened to reach Britain. The people who were residing here were speaking a language by name Celtic, C-E-L-T-I-C, Celtic. These, were, these people were pushed from this region to Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. This happened in 5th century AD. And the people living in Angles were speaking a language and the same language was being taken to uh, England. It, is, it was called Englisk, E-N-G-L-I-S-C. And because of that, you get the description of the words that we use today, that is England and English. Take a look at the map once again. And remember that Germanic invaders entered Britain on the east, on the east, 
find south coast in the 5th century british english is much older than american english when the french invaded england in 1066 the french did carry with them some 10000 new words the british the british had colonized many countries of the world likewise the americans the language english came the language english came to north america via the first british settlements during the 1700s the british did not have formal standards for spelling in the 1750s samuel johnson established a standard british dictionary and 60 years later nova webster n o a h nova webster established a standard american english dictionary as america was keen to distance itself from britain and webster wanted to rationalize certain forms of spelling the americans adopted what some british refer to as wrong spelling students you may be wondering why the americans wanted to distance themselves from the british while studying history you might have come across something like the american revolutionary war the american revolution was a colonial revolt which occurred between 1765 and 1783 the american patriots in the 13 colonies that defeated british in the american revolutionary war with the assistance of france winning independence from great britain and establishing the united states of america the american revolution freed colonists from british rule and brought changes in the values of the american culture they wanted to be different from the rest of the world it became an energetic goal oriented society individualism independence and privacy was given importance Americans took pride in their own accomplishments. They believe competition brings out the best in people and the free enterprise leads to progress and produces success. Americans place less value on past events and constantly look ahead to tomorrow. They believe that it is immoral to waste time. Formality is un-American to them. a casual democratic attitude between people is more accepted directness openness honesty practicality and efficiency are given importance material goods are seen as the just rewards of hard work the evidence of god's favor as far as mannerism is concerned english people are very rigid two englishmen may travel together for 6 to 7 hours sitting by the side of one another but will never exchange a word they need someone to introduce one another it is only then they will shake hands smile and exchange words when it comes to americans they are very friendly they like small talk they don't need anyone to introduce one another even if you happen to land in america they will smile in a friendly manner say hello and question whether you are in need of help let it be in a gathering marriage birthday etc the americans are quite certain that they will make themselves comfortable there they know how to break the ice break the ice is an idiomatic expression the americans know how to start the conversation Hello. america has all america has always retained its uniqueness america's ideology is different from others it is one of the largest countries on earth so we can say that america's power comes from its size i get to it america is rich in natural resources and human capital of which they are proud of 
Having learned about the culture of the Americans, now let us concentrate on the actual difference between the American and British English. As far as grammar is concerned, you do find change in American and British English. Do you have any siblings is the way Americans ask. But in British English, you have people questioning, have you got any brothers or sisters? You find change in the auxiliary verb used by Americans and the British people. So we can say that as far as the usage of auxiliary verb is concerned, you do find change. In American English, they say it is important that she be told. Once again, difference in the auxiliary verb used by American English, Americans and the British people. British people say it is important that she is told. Next sentence. The jury has not yet reached its decision. The collective noun, for collective noun jury, see the verb that is being used, that is has. In British English, the jury have not yet reached their decision. The American collective noun is singular, whereas British people use plural as such. American English, go get your book, go and fetch your book, the British people say. American English, he dug into the water, past participle. British English, he dived, simple past, he dived into the water. American English, you must come visit me real soon. They shorten all the words and that is being noticed here. You must come and visit me really soon. Real is used by Americans. Really is being used by the English people. As far as usage of words are concerned, you do find change. American English, I'll try and visit you on the weekend. British people, I'll try and visit you at the weekend. On is the preposition used by the American, whereas it is at that is being used by the English people. American English, please write me when you arrive. British English, please write to me when you arrive. American English, call me as soon as you get there. You find differences in the vocabulary used by the Americans and the British people. Here you find such a change. Ring me or phone me, it is not call me, but instead ring me or phone me. But these days you find people using call me also because we are being influenced by uh, Americans, movies, uh, then newspapers, journals, all this have uh, influenced the way British people or the people who follow British English. And therefore, these days you find call me being used by the people. Ring me or phone me as soon as you get there. American English, most everyone has a telephone and a refrigerator these days. They, you find differences in the vocabulary used by the Americans and the British people. One such sentence is here. Almost, instead of most, we use almost. Almost everyone has a telephone and a fridge, it is not refrigerator, but fridge, fridge these days. American English, if you make a mistake, you will just have to do it over. Over is the preposition that is being used, British English. If you make a mistake, you will just have to do it again. American English, he was born on third, uh, sorry, uh, the month comes first, that is March comes first, and then the date and then the year. Whereas British people, he was born on date comes first. This is being followed by Indians also because India was being colonized by the British people. So uh, we write the date first, 27, then 
month march year 1981 the secretary said the punctuation that is being used by the americans is come on here mr clinton will see you soon british english the secretary said that the punctuation used here is colon mr clinton will see you soon these days even we uh, those who follow british english we don't use colon here instead we use comma we are being influenced by the uh, british people british versus american words for clothing this is called trainers by british people but american say it is sneakers this is ipa script ipa is international phonetic alphabet this ipa script is very important in order to pronounce a word correctly this is called jumper or pullover by the british people whereas the americans call it sweater this is waistcoat for british people it becomes vest for the americans you may wonder once again why is that the americans have different word as such i said that they simply didn't want to, to follow the british people they wanted to show that they are different from uh, british people they are superior from british people they are above from the rest of the world and therefore you find change in the vocabulary used by the americans this is a braces for british people it becomes suspenders for americans this becomes chips for british people whereas americans say french fries this becomes crisps for british people whereas americans say it is potato chips biscuit we are being influenced by british people because british people happen to rule us for number of years biscuit for british people but americans say it is cookie peckish to feel hungry this is the word used by the british people but americans say hungry spelling differences color c o l o u r is the spelling that is being used by the british people americans use c o l o r they felt that uh, u is not essential at all moreover nova webster felt that it is old fashion to use u and therefore this spelling is being given by nova webster aeroplane this is aeroplane for british people airplane for americans check that is being used in the banks see the spelling uh, c c h e q q u e s they wanted especially nova webster wanted it to be spelled the way it sounded and therefore t e r is being maintained by him color gray see the change in spelling g r e y whereas the americans uh pronounce uh, spell it as g r a y you find change you find change in the words uh, for vegetables courgette by the british people zucchini by the americans aubergine by the british people egg plant this is ipa script egg plant by the americans if you say brinjal in america they cannot understand anything only if you say egg plant they will know that to which vegetable you are referring to this is jacket potato for british people and baked potato for americans you find similar word being used by british people as well as americans as far as this vegetable is concerned string bean by british people even americans use it string bean another word used by the british people is runner bean vocabulary differences the slide reveals to you the vocabulary differences between british people and uh, americans block of flat this is block of flat this is ipa script this tells you how to pronounce this word and it is apartment building for americans 
This is flat for British people, American say it is apartment. Ground floor, this becomes ground floor for British people, but the Americans say it is a first floor. This is a first floor for the British people, whereas it becomes second floor for Americans. Difference in the vocabulary, once again. This is underground for British people, Americans say subway. Chemists, medical shop becomes chemists for British people, whereas Americans say it is drugstore or pharmacy. This is post box for British people, but Americans say it is a phone booth. Q, this is the word that is being used in India, and this is the spelling, but Americans say it is a line. Differences in the words as far as car parts are concerned. Vocabulary differences. This is bonnet for British people. Americans say it is put. This part becomes boot for British people, whereas Americans say it is trunk. This becomes a front part or the front glass of the vehicle or car becomes a windscreen for British people whereas it becomes windshield for Americans. This part becomes indicator for British people, whereas it becomes a blinker or turn signal for Americans. Change in the spelling. This becomes a tire, T-Y-R-E, tire for British people. Tire, they give importance to sound as such. Americans give importance to sound, and therefore they want to spell any word as it sounds, and therefore they have maintained the spelling T I R E. Food that is being prepared and cooked in a restaurant is being carried by people home. This is called a takeaway by British people, whereas Americans say it is takeout. A list of the times when something, a bus, train, or aeroplane is expected to leave or arrive is called timetable by British people, but Americans say it is schedule. Rubber that we use in order to erase something is called rubber by British people, whereas Americans say it is eraser. A system of sending letters and packages from one person to another is called post by British people, whereas Americans say it is male. Difference in the vocabulary usage is seen. Once again, you find a difference in the vocabulary used by the British and the Americans. This is the plow by the British people, but Americans say the Big Dipper. Holiday, to enjoy a holiday, the word that the Americans use is vacation. Season, autumn. British people say it is autumn, whereas Americans say fall. Even autumn is being used these days. Globalization and the literature that has come from uh, England has influenced the Americans. And therefore, you get the description of autumn being used by Americans these days. This becomes high street for British people, whereas the Americans say it is main street. Difference in the vocabulary used by the British and Americans. This becomes lorry for British people, whereas Americans say it is truck. This becomes, this vehicle becomes estate car for British people. Americans say it is a station wagon. This becomes flat for British people, whereas Americans say it is apartment. Lift, which takes you from one floor to another, is called lift by British people, but Americans say it is elevator. Spelling differences can be seen in this slide. O-D-O-U-R, verbal, U, U is being used. I said Noah Webster felt that you is not necessary. It is uh, out fashion to use uh, you, and therefore uh, you is deleted in their spelling, O-D-O-R. 
adore, adore. Pajamas, pajamas. Program, they shorten the word. We use P-R-O-G-R-A-M-E, but they shorten the word. M-E is missing here. Parlor, U is used, but they do not use uh, U. P-A-R-L-O-R. Apologize here. Z sound is there, and therefore they use Z sound here. Vocabulary differences. This is nappy for British people, but Americans say it is diaper. This is dummy for British people, but Americans say pacifier. Toilet becomes loo for British people, restroom or bathroom for Americans. Telly, telly for British people, but Americans say TV or television. We are being influenced by Americans. Even we use the word TV or television. Vocabulary differences once again. These are called sweets by British people. Americans say it is candy. Candy floss, this is called candy floss by the British people. Americans say it is cotton candy. This becomes ice lolly for British people, but Americans say popsicle. This becomes trickle for British people. Syrup, solid syrup. This is called molasses by the Americans. Once again, this chart deals with vocabulary differences. This is torch for British people. Even we Indians use the word torch, but Americans say it is a flashlight. Mobile phone for British people, cell phone by the Americans. This is called rubbish by the British people, but Americans say garbage or trash. This is bin for British people, but it becomes trash can for the Americans. Spelling differences. This is, see the spelling behavior. U is used here, but Americans don't use U. Neighbor, see the spelling. E U is missing. Favorite, see their spelling. Favorite. Humor, humor. Rumor, rumor. This becomes football for British people, whereas Americans say it is soccer. This is called pitch by the British people. Even we say it is pitch. Uh, Americans say it is field. Sometimes we you even use the word field for this. This is draw for British people, game, uh, which ends in neither side winning. It becomes draw for British people, whereas for Americans it becomes tie. This is the uniform used by the British people, whereas Sorry, uniform is being used by Americans uh, and the British people say this is kicked. Vocabulary difference. This is anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise for British people, but Americans say counterclockwise. These are knots and crosses for British people, but Americans say Tic-tac-toe. Pins used for clothes is called clothes peg by the British people, but Americans say it is clothes pin. Tea towel or tea cloth for British people, dish towel for the Americans. Spelling differences. We have seen these differences. Arbor, A-R-B-O-R, U is missing. Humor, U is used, but Americans don't use it because Noah Webster felt that U is not necessary. Secondly, they want it to be different from others, rest of the world, and therefore they have brought change in, this, in these uh, words. Arbor, U is missing. Enamored, 
to be in love. Enamored, enamored. Aluminium, aluminium. You find difference in pronunciation also. Later, towards the end, we shall watch a, a video where we get to know clear difference between the American and British English as far as pronunciation is concerned. Mustache by British people, mustache by the Americans. Speciality, specialty by the Americans. Mummy, this is IPS script. This helps you to read uh, the word properly. Mummy by the British people. Mummy by the Americans. Motorway, this is called motorway by the British people, whereas Americans say fresh way uh, or highway. This is called pavement by the British people. Americans say it is sidewalk. Zebra cross for British people. Americans say crosswalk. Road surface by British people. Pavement by Americans. This is important. Z for British people. Americans pronounce it as Z. Full stop for British people. Americans say this is period. Not zero or not by the Amer British people. And Americans say it is zero. Postal code, Americans say it is zip code. Spelling differences. Curb, K is used by British people, whereas Americans use C. Flow, see the change uh, in the usage of the spelling, P-L-O-W. They pronounce a word as it sounds. Mold, M-O-L-D, mold. Licorice, licorice is a plant. A kind of syrup is being prepared out of it. Licorice by the Americans. Cause Z sound is there and therefore they uh, write C O Z Y. Cause this diversion they call detour. British people say this is diversion, whereas Americans say it is detour. Fly over, Americans say overpass. Lorry for British people and truck for Americans. This is road surface for British people, pavement for Americans. Car park for British people, parking lot for Americans. We have come across this. Bonnet, hood. Boot for British people. This is called boot by the British people, whereas Americans say it is trunk, petrol. But Americans say gas. Although we find a lot of differences between American and British English, it is not wrong to use either British English or American English as such. You can use any spelling, any word, but you must be in a position to know which is the word that is being used by you as such.
conclude, American English and British English originated from the same language, and the differences uh, are seen in meaning, spelling, usage, vocabulary, preposition, and collective nouns. One has to admit that these differences have caused inconvenience to, British, to English learners and users, but as the communication and cooperation between America and the UK are deeper and deeper, differences between American and British English are becoming smaller and smaller. Today, America has its hold on every country. It is due to its leading position in politics, economy, culture, and military, a large number of American English words are introduced to in, uh, British English. As English learners, we should have right understanding of these differences. It is not correct to say that one is better than the other. Remember that both spellings are perfectly acceptable. It might be good to choose one style and be consistent. And when it comes to making choices between American or British English in your writing or speaking. It's good to know what vocabulary uh, you have at your disposal. Today, the study of English no doubt is very important and it is good that you know the differences between the two as such. The video that we are going to watch now clearly tells you the difference between uh, the pronunciation that we have Hi, I'm Oli. Welcome to Oxford Online English. In this lesson, you can learn about the differences between American and British pronunciation. I'm going to teach Ollie how to say words like water or clock correctly. No, no. I'm going to teach Gina how to pronounce water and clock properly. We're joking, of course. There's no one correct way to pronounce English. There are many ways to speak English not just British or American. Also, remember that both the UK and the USA are big countries and not everybody talks the same way. What you'll see in this lesson are general differences between British and American pronunciation. Let's start with one of the biggest differences between British and American pronunciation. This is a difference you can see. Watch an American person talk. Watch a British person talk. What do you notice? British English is much more frontal. It uses the lips a lot more. By contrast, American English speakers move their lips less. The lips are more relaxed and the mouth is generally wider. In American English, sounds generally come from further back in the mouth, closer to the throat. British English is a lot tenser. To sound British, you need to produce a lot of sounds at the front of your mouth. Vowel sounds are often shorter than in American English, meaning you need to move between sounds faster. All of this means you need to use the muscles of your lips and cheeks more. For example, let's think about the word water. When I say it, the first vowel sound is much more relaxed. I don't use my lips to pronounce the sound at all. Water. The vowel sound is often a little longer than in British English. Then, the rest of the sounds come from further back. Water. When I say water, the vowel sound is much tenser. 
I'm using the muscles of my cheeks and pushing my lips into a small rounded shape. Water. I then pronounce the rest of the sounds near the front of my mouth without really relaxing back much. Water. Water. Let me try that the American way. Water. Water. Hmm. Can I do it in the British style? Water. Water. So, American English is more relaxed and tends to be spoken with a wider mouth, using the lips less. British English is tenser, more frontal, and uses the lips a lot more. What other effects does this have on pronunciation? Think about the word phone. This word has a diphthong, a double vowel sound, O. Oh. In British English, this sound is produced with fast, minimal movements. To sound British, you should move your mouth as little as possible. Phone. Phone. In American English, you need to relax your jaw and move your mouth more. The sound is longer, and the two parts of the vowel are more distinct. Phone. Phone. You can find a similar difference in other diphthongs. For example, think about the word how. When I say it, my mouth is more relaxed, and I move more compared to a British English speaker. Again, this means the sound is slightly longer and the two parts of the vowel sound are more separated. How? How? When I say how, I produce the diphthong with a very small movement of my lips. The movement is all near the front of my mouth. This produces a shorter, faster sound. The two parts of the vowel sound aren't very distinct because I'm moving through the sound quickly. How? How? You can see a similar difference with words like train or rice, which also contain diphthongs, a and i. In British English, the diphthongs are pronounced with smaller movements and the sounds are shorter and faster. Train. Rice. In American English, the vowels are pronounced with the mouth more relaxed, the mouth moves more, and the sounds are longer and more separated. Train. Rice. However, the differences in pronunciation aren't just in diphthongs. Some other vowel sounds are also different in British and American English. For example, think about the word cat. This word has an a ah vowel sound. In American English, this is a diphthong. You move your tongue through the sound, so the vowel sound changes as you pronounce it. Cat. Cat. In British English, the a ah sound isn't a diphthong. It's a single sound. To pronounce the sound with a British accent, again, you need to use more tension. This is because you have to hold the sound until you pronounce the following consonant. You can't relax into the consonant like you can in American English. Cat. Cat. You have to hold the tension which for this sound is near the throat in the back of the mouth. Cat. I find the American a ah really difficult, and while writing this script, I realized I can't pronounce it at all. Cat, cat. Yeah, see? Gina, does that work both ways? Let's see if I can do it in the British way. I have to hold the vowel tense 
instead of relaxing into the consonant. Let's try. Cat. Cat. Some vowel sounds are just different in that words are pronounced with different vowel sounds in British and American English. This is particularly common with the vowels a, like the a in cat, and r, like the a in father. Sometimes words which have one sound in British English will have the other sound in American English. For example, in British English, we say banana, sultana, kebab, and lasagna. But in American English, we would say banana, sultana, kebab, and lasagna. The sounds are exactly opposite. There are many, many differences in vowel pronunciation between British and American English. Too many to list here. Let's look at one more important one. There are many examples where the sounds a and a uh switch with the sound a. A famous example is the word tomato. It's pronounced with an a sound in American English. But in British English, it has an r sound, tomato. Other examples, basil, apparatus, comrade or apricot. While I would say basil, apparatus, comrade, and apricot. Okay, so that's all for the vowel sounds. Key points. American vowel sounds are often longer and more relaxed than British vowel sounds. Also, Many words are pronounced with a different vowel sound in British and American English. What about consonant sounds? Are they also different in British and American English? Like with vowels, there are many differences in consonant pronunciation between British and American English. Let's start with the two most important differences. These relate to R sounds and T sounds. In British English, in words written with a vowel plus R, the R is not normally pronounced. Car, nurse, horse. In American English, these R sounds are pronounced. Car, nurse, horse. Also, R sounds at the end of a word are pronounced. Look at this question. Are there any more people over there? In this question, every word has an R sound at the end, except for any and people. Listen again. Can you hear the R sounds? Are there any more people over there? In the UK, we pronounce R at the end of a word only if the next word starts with a vowel. Are there any more people over there? I don't pronounce R sounds on R, more, over, or there. I pronounce R on there because the next word, any, starts with a vowel. Listen once more. Are there any more people over there? So, R sounds are one big difference between American and British pronunciation. What's the other big difference? T sounds. Look at a sentence. Betty's daughter's butter is better than Tamara's or Matt's. In American English, when you have a T sound between two vowel sounds, the T sound changes to a D sound. Betty's daughter's butter is better than Tamara's or Matt's. What about the T sounds in the names Tamara and Matt? Do they change? 
No, they're pronounced normally. Why? Remember, the T sound changes only if it's between two vowels. In other cases, T is pronounced normally. This doesn't happen in British English. To sound British, you should pronounce all of the T sounds. Betty's daughter's butter is better than Tamara's or Matt's. Those are the biggest differences with consonant pronunciation. But we'll look at one more. Another difference is in words like Tuesday, tutor, duty, or news. What connects these words? They all start with a consonant plus an oo sound. In American English, the pronunciation is closer to the spelling. Tuesday, tutor, duty, news. So, how's it different in British pronunciation? Listen and see if you can hear the difference. Tuesday, tutor, duty, news. There's an extra sound there which isn't in the American pronunciation. In British English, you need to add a y before the oo sound. Tuesday, tutor, duty, news. This happens when you have an oo sound after certain consonants like t, d, or n. Okay. So now you know something about the differences in the pronunciation of sounds between American and British English. Are there other important differences? Yes, there are. There are also differences in word stress between American and British English. For example, listen to five words. Advertisement inquiry, mustache, adult, translate. When I say them, where's the stress? Now, listen to Ollie. Advertisement, inquiry, mustache, adult, translate. Where's the stress when I pronounce them? Can you hear the difference with Gina's pronunciation? Listen once more. Advertisement. Inquiry. Mustache. Adult. Translate. Can you hear the stresses? Here they are. Now, Listen to the British pronunciation one more time. Try to hear where this stress is and how it's different. Advertisement, inquiry, moustache, adult, translate. Can you hear? Here are the stresses. As usual with word stress, there aren't really rules. However, it's useful to know that word stress can be different in American and British English. Let's look at one more difference between British and American pronunciation. Do you know this sound? It's a schwa. It's common in both British and American English. However, in British English, other vowel sounds reduce to a schwa sound much more often than in American. American English. Hmm, what do I mean by reduce? Look at five words. In British English, all of these words have at least one schwa sound. Can you hear where it is? Strawberry, ordinary, innovative, category, ceremony. Now, listen to Gina and see if you can hear the difference. Strawberry, ordinary, innovative, 
category, ceremony. Can you hear the difference? In British English, the E in strawberry is pronounced with a schwa sound. The full vowel sound is reduced to a schwa. However, in American English, we pronounce the vowel with its full sound, e. Listen to the five words one more time. Pay attention to the highlighted vowel sounds. Strawberry. Ordinary. Innovative. Category. Ceremony. Now, listen to Ollie one more time. Hear how British English reduces these vowels to schwa sounds. Strawberry, ordinary, innovative, category, ceremony. Can you hear it now? This reduction is more common in British English, but sometimes it goes the other way too. If a word ends I-L-E, Today, the study of the differences between American and British English has helped us to get connected from across the nation. I extend my sincere gratitude to the organizing committee and all the participants. I also thank the technical assistants who have, give, who have done a great job. Thank you. If you have any questions, you may ask. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor Meenakshi. It was really a very interesting uh, session. Thank you, Professor uh, Prasanna. Yeah. Uh, some of the questions I have picked up, as yeah. the students cannot interact directly, if they mm -hmm. type it in the chat box, we can pick it up during the interactive session. Now, there is one student who has asked, can we use both the accents while talking? Yeah, can we mixture? Yeah, you can. While talking, it's not a problem. But uh, while writing something, especially uh, you are writing for some magazine uh, or you are in, uh, writing uh, for uh, international journal, then you will have to stick to one particular style as such, either British English or American English. Okay. Then most of we Indians make use of British English. It is maybe because we are very much influenced by them as they had ruled India quite yeah. for a long time. Yeah, true. Our accent is similar to British English. True. Yes. Okay. We don't yeah. make use of more of nasal sound like Americans. Right. Right. Like but these days, we especially say glass in rather than glass. Yeah. Class rather true. than class. True. Yes. Because uh, English were in our country for a very long time and the initial teachers of English got trained by British people. Therefore, we are in, uh, British English is mostly used in uh, India. India. Okay. okay. Now, the students were telling that the speakers have got to go very slow as they have got to take up the points. Uh, but what I suggest uh, the uh, participants is that the resource persons have already been informed that they have got to keep up a medium space because within a sh short period of time, they have got to complete so much that they have got to reach out to the participants. So you have got time, one hour time, to work out the questions when it is put up there in the chat box. Now, another question that the participants have asked is that, not connected to British English and Americanism, it is connected to their registration. Mm. Uh, many have joined and watched this program live, but now they want to join the course. Uh, they have not registered it earlier. So what could we do, madam, is their question. So I'd like to tell them that now you cannot register, but you can watch every day this program live on YouTube. 
Now, you don't need any link for this. You have to go to the search bar of YouTube and type VVN Degree College. 11 o'clock every day, this program will start and they can watch it. And what they have to do is at 1.10 uh, during the, after the second session, we send the link uh, for feedback and the test questions on the respective sessions of the day. They have got to give the feedback and answer the questions. So automatically they get registered. If they score above 50%, they will get course completion certificate. If they are not able to score above 50%, then they will get e-certificate of participation. This I would like to tell the participants because many students are asking the same questions in the chat box. So thank you. Thank you, Minakshi. It was thank you, really Professor Prasanna. Yes, uh, it was really a very useful and very in informative uh, session. I extend. Thank you, thank you Madam. Yes, on, on behalf of management of BBN Degree College, principal, uh, CENDA, all the teachers and the students, I extend a very hearty thanks to you for accepting our invitation and taking up this session. Thank you. I also thank all the viewers and the participants, registered participants, for listening to the talk and sending messages, uh, their questions and all on the chat box. Yes. Now, 12.10, we will now start with the second session. Second session is on functional English. The second session will start now. It is from 12.10 to 1.30, 1.15 from 150 to 130 we will uh, have interactive session now dorin uh, professor dorin snehalata kochian the resource person of the second session is already with us okay now we have professor dorin snehalata kochian joining with us to teach uh, functional english i extend a warm welcome to Madam Dorin Snehalata Kotian, who is Associate Professor, HOD of English, IQAC, and NAC Coordinator at Government First Grade College, Hoskote. She is a warm, friendly teacher and has a rich experience in the teaching field. She was a nodal officer in head office of the Department of Collegiate Education, Bengaluru, under the special schemes section from 2010 to 2013. Madam Doreen Snehalata was the textbook committee member of Bengaluru University for the year 2017 to 2019. Today, she will guide us on introducing requests, offering help and giving instructions in English. So this is the third session of online effective English language development course. Over to Professor Doreen Snehalata Kotian. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, madam. Okay. I can go ahead? Yes. Okay. Please. Good afternoon, each and everyone who is viewing this program. Very good afternoon. My name is Doreen Snehalata Kotian. I'm an associate professor of English and the HOD of English of Government First Grade College, Hoskote. At the outset, I thank the principal of the college of the VVN College and the IQAC coordinator, 
and head of the Department of English of the VVN College, my close friend and colleague, Professor Prasanna Udpikar, for giving me this opportunity to share a few tips on English communication skills. I hope this session will be useful to everyone. I will just share the screen now, madam. Yes. Is that fine? Can I go ahead? Yes, it's very okay. clear. Okay, okay. Uh, today's topic is English communication skills. Madam put it as functional English also. I will be concentrating or, uh, on a few topics. I have divided my talk into six parts. Communication, I will be talking on effective communication, language as a tool of communication, role of English as a medium of communication. Then I will be talking about greetings, introducing oneself and the others, making requests, offering help, and giving instructions. This is the broad outlay of my talk. Before we start talking about spoken English and communication, we shall try to understand what is communication and how language, which is an important tool of communication, becomes so important in our day-to-day -day conversation. What is communication? Communication is the exchange of information or ideas. It is the art of expressing a message in a way that the others understand. Communication happens when the sender has a message to be communicated and has a purpose to communicate the message. Students, right now, I am communicating. I'm trying to in exchange or I'm trying to give you some ideas and I'm trying to express certain things so that you understand what I'm trying to say. And so this is, uh, this is what is called as communication. Now communication involves many things. Communic effective communication involves an appropriate voice and a body language. When I am talking to you, I am modulating my voice. My head, I, ha I am using so many gestures. My head is shaking. You can, you can see the way I'm smiling. So this is the body language. Most of us, when we learn a new language or we talk to people who do not know our language, try to use body language so that they can understand what we are trying to say. You know, for a ex small example, when you have maids in your house, helps in your house, help in your house coming from a different background and you do not know how to communicate with them, then you try to use all kinds of language, your gestures, hand movements, head movements, so that they try to understand. And so communication happens like that also. You understand the situation and then the people involved in it. See, suppose we are communicating to small children. There is a difference between in communicating to adults and small children. When you talk to children, when you tell them a story, you tell there was a bear which came to the house or there was a tiger which came to the house and you change your voice, you change your facial expression and that is children are very thrilled with it. But if you say the same thing to an adult, it doesn't much matter because tiger and a bear is nothing for them because they do not, uh, they have passed that age. And so we have to know to whom you are communicating. And then, and uh, then 
you have to understand the message which is being communicated and also respond appropriately in classrooms when you and when you speak to the students and when the student shake their head or they smile or they nod then you know that they are responding appropriately now how does communication take place now come in, there is also communication which is happening in, in different situations now we have formal communication where we write letters and then we have semi formal communication we talk through telephones we have informal communication we talk face to face and language is the most important and primary tool of communication now to communicate you need language and this is the most important and primary tool of communication we have so many languages in the world but today we are speaking only of english language why is english and spoken english so important english is one of the most widely and commonly spoken language in the world it is a language of international business english has its place in technological and scientific advancement it is the language of industry and of the internet therefore speaking english opens a whole world of opportunities it gives you more confidence it increases your self esteem when you speak in english not just that you can talk to people who do not know your language suppose you meet someone who belong to a different who belongs to a different country if you know english and if the other person also knows english you can exchange so many thoughts and ideas you can talk about your culture you can explain things to them in a language which is common and most of the time english takes this role today jobs in call centers ppos need good knowledge and fluency of english now many of you who are watching this program may be rural students or students who are not very confident with the use of english even before you enter the class most of our students will feel english is difficult and so they don't want to talk in english they have a mental block now if you are not open to learning the language then there will be a problem and therefore you should take away this mental block and you should be able to learn the language now how do we speak a language when you learn a new language we learn to converse or talk and then you often use uh, we use the often used phrases see a small little child when it's born will not know the language but then it will listen to its parents or the people who are uh, with which it uh, interacts and learns the new language okay and that's why we use the often used phrases how are you what are you doing how do you do i'm fine and these are the words we start with and then we repeat and we practice and we also learn language in new situations and then most of our talking is informal communication and informal communication is used to communicate with others now how do you begin with communication now communication usually starts with greetings i will start now with how we start learning to converse with people greetings are of different kinds you have a small you have a picture you have picture on the screen you can see how people greet differently in different countries what is a greeting greeting is an act of communication in which human beings intentionally make their presence known to each other you'll say hello hi to show or suggest um the type of relationship and usually when you are cordial and friendly only then you will greet people and so you when you are friendly you will say hello hi you also greet 
uh, your greeting shows your formal or your social setup. That is your whether you're in a formal position or in an informal position. And then between individuals or group of people coming in contact with each other, a polite word or a sign or a welcome of recognition. When you say hi, then you know that this is a friendly person. You can continue your conversation. And then it's a formal expression of goodwill. As in a meeting, it can be said in a meeting or in a written address, because usually you will say a warm greeting to everyone, a warm, a warm greetings to all. Now, there are certain useful phrases when you start uh, conversation and when you, uh, when you start conversation and when you start talking to people. Now, greetings are of two kinds. There is formal greetings and informal greetings. When you are talking in a formal setup, example, when you're talking to your teacher or when you're talking to your principal, you will say, hello, good morning, good morning, sir. How are you? How are you doing? How, how have you been doing? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And in an informal setup, you'll say, hi, hey, what's up? How's it going? What's new? What have you been up to? And how are you? How are you? Okay, now, as youngsters and as students, we sometimes make this mistake. Usually, you'll say, hi, ma'am. That is our usual style. But students, in a formal setup, it is always very important to say, good morning. Good morning, madam. And in an informal setup, okay, you can say hi. You say hi to your friends. You'll say, hey, what's up? And now the latest uh, uh, thing is, what's up, dude? So this is all your vocabulary, but there is a difference between formal and informal greeting, and especially in your college setup, in your business setup, and in formal situations, you have to maintain the formal greetings. When you greet, you respond to the greeting. When someone says hello, you don't turn your face and go, you respond to it. So if Sam, someone says, how are you? You will say, very well, how do you do? Or you'll say very well, fine, thank you. Okay, and there are some other um, um, starters here, conversation starters here on your screen. You can just pick this up. You'll say, nice to see you. What's new? How's it going? Hi there. What have you been up to? What, are, uh, uh, what look, what's a cat dragged in? Hey, what's up? How are things? Nice to meet with you, and so on and so forth. Therefore, what I want to tell you, stress here is there is something called formal conversation, uh, formal star conversation starters, and informal. When you say hi, what's up? That's an informal statement. Whereas how are you is a formal statement, and so you respond in the same way. Now, there are certain useful phrases. When you greet people, there are some useful phrases. When meeting after someone after a long time, you'll say, good to see you again. Students, it's very important. Your body language is also very important. Suppose you meet your friend after 20 years. You can't say, good to see you again. You'll say, hi, it's good to see you again. And the peace person also feels so good about it. It's been a long time. You know, the way you express is more, very important. And then when you close your conversation, you say, good night, see you later, bye. So the, the word itself will tell you, um, you know, the, uh, whether you're closing your conversation or you're going ahead with it. Now look at this. When you arrive at a place, you will, uh, where, where I uh, arrive at a place, you will say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all things like that. When you leave your place, you will say goodbye, see you later. And when you want to know if someone is sick, you will say, how is he doing? And things like that. And when, uh, when, when you meet someone for the first time, you'll say, hello, good to, pleased to meet you. Good to meet you. How do you do? And these are some of the expressions. Now, we also greet people on different occasions. We have so many festivals. We have so many occasions. 
and students, it's so important that we should know to acknowledge certain occasions. Now your friend has got a prize. And so you're very happy. You have to encourage that person by saying, congratulations. It's celebration time. You'll say party, give me a party. And on festivals, you say, happy, happy new year, happy Deepavali, Merry Christmas. And someone, you meet somebody and then you say, pleased to meet you. And then you have to answer an exam. You can say, good luck, all the best for your exams. And see, these are certain uh, greetings which, uh, with which uh, these are certain expressions with which we greet people on different occasions. Now there are also a certain courtesies. When, so, when, they, when you meet, so, I mean, when you wish someone, you will also will have to respond. You'll say, thank you. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. Good luck. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Merry Christmas. When you say Merry Christmas to you too, same to you. So there are certain things you also respond in the same way. Now, there are certain ways with which you, there are certain other ways with which you respond to greetings. Now you'll say, so you meet somebody and you say, hello, John, how are you? And the other person says, hi, Kiran, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Great, thank you. Or you will say, I'm very well, thank you. Sometimes you may say, not too bad, thank you. Not very well. Okay, now see the picture. How are you? Not too bad. How's it going? Pretty good. How's life? Great. How's everything? I'm okay. So these are the responses to greetings. Now there are certain occasions on which, uh, in which you will have to greet people or send messages. Now suppose your colleague or your friend is going to go to another college or uh, go to uh, uh, another office. So what do you say? You will give them a con uh, farewell. And there you will say, good luck on your new assignment or to your new assignment. When uh, on the birth of a child, you will say, congratulations. Someone's leaving a country, you will say, bon voyage. When someone is ill or in hospital, will say, get well soon or wish you a speedy recovery. And especially in your, on the last day of uh, your school or your college, your teacher will uh, give you all the tips. And finally, she'll say, good luck, students, wishing you all the very best. And this is how a teacher will wish you. And then if someone arrives from a different place, then you will say, welcome, welcome to my place. Then welcome to my house. And if someone's retiring, you will say happy retired life. And someone is getting promoted, you will say congratulations. Students, it's very important for us to you know, communicate these things because our communication and our relationship with anybody depends on these small tips and see these small messages. The more friendly you are, the more important it is to have these small words, small, small, small phrases, so that you can catch the attention of the others and continue with your friendship. Now, the, first, the, the next point is introducing. This is a very, very important topic. Introducing, I'll be talking about introducing yourself and introducing the others. Now. Some useful phrases, introducing oneself. When you introduce yourself, uh, usually in the beginning of the year or in the first day of college, what do you do? You will meet so many students, so many friends. They will be all from different colleges. And so you will be very confused. You don't know what to do. And so you will just look at each other. Or if you all have come from a, a pre-university college, you will group together. But then you will also want to talk to other people. And then during those times, you will used to have to use, you will have to use the appropriate words. Now you will say, you should use, I'd like to introduce myself and then say, my name is, I am so-and-so. That is, my name is Sunil. I am Sunil. 
I am from such and such college. I am from uh, government college, KR Puram. Hi, I am Sunil. I am from such and such college. Students, this, there is one thing which is very important here. I have heard so many people using this word, myself, Sunil. This is a wrong usage. Myself, Sunil, I am from such and such college is wrong. You will say, my name is, or you will say, I am. I hope you have understood this because I have heard so many people who are very well trained using these words, which are wrong. So remember this. Now, this is one way of introducing yourself. You will say, hi, my name is, whatever your name is. I come from India or uh, you can say a city. I live in, a, in Bangalore. I am 20 years. There are five people in my family. They are my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, and my grandmother, whatever. I am a student at VVN College or wherever. My major is, or my majors are, history, economics, political science, whatever. My favorite subject is, whatever subject you like. This is a simple way of introducing yourself. Now, you can talk a little more. You can tell about your favorite sports. You can tell about what kind of job you would want. If you go for, uh, I mean, if, you, uh, the, if it is outside the college situation and things like that. So especially you, when you introduce yourself, you will start with your name, where do you come from and which is your city, how many people are in your family and things like that. Now look at some of the examples of introducing oneself. A, may I introduce myself? I am Shweta. This is a very formal way of introducing. It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Smita. Hello, my name is Glenn. How do you do? I'm Prashant. Hi, I'm Neha. Hi, I'm Nirak. Hello, I'd like to introduce myself. Especially students in classrooms, um, you know, the first day of college, all the teachers will ask you, come on, introduce yourself. And always, most of the time, students feel a little nervous. They just stand up and just tell their name. They, they'll tell their name and sit down because they are so nervous in front of other students. Now, if you make it a point to get these few sentences, you will be very, very confident on your first day of college. And this, you should do it with practice. And especially with the rural students, uh, you know, English is a little difficult for them. More, not, uh, not that it is difficult. It's just that it's a mental block with them. And so you will say, my name is Smita or my name is Sita. I completed my PUC in government PU college, whatever place, Mulbagal. I'm studying in first year BA HEP section in GFGC, Mulbagal. I'm from Kolar. I'm just giving you an example of Mulbagan. In the same way, you can talk about the place you have studied. This will be in past tense. The college you are now studying in, that is the new college you have joined, present and continuous. And then where do you come from? That will be is I come from. That is in the simple present tense. Now, there is another important thing. You introduce others. Students, this is very important to introduce the others. Suppose you and, uh, you, uh, and your friend are walking. Suddenly you meet another old friend of yours. You're very busy talking. And then you meet your friend and you say, hi, how are you? And then you talk to your friend. If you forget to introduce your old friend to your new friend, it is very, very embarrassing for the new friend to just look at your faces. And it is not manners for him or her to intervene and talk. So it is very important that you should always introduce the other person. Maybe your friend or in official situations, you first introduce the other person who is unknown. So how do you introduce? You will say, this is Sita. This is my friend Sita. I'd like to introduce my friend Sita from 
my new college. Here is Sita. I feel privileged to introduce my friend. In formal situations also, when you introduce your guest, uh, Madam introduced me. So when you introduce the guest, your guest, you will say, you will words, I feel, you will uh, use words like this. I would like to introduce the resource person of today. She is so-and-so from such and such college. It is very important that you should introduce others, both in formal and in informal setup. Now, there are certain responses. In an informal setup, when you when someone introduce you will introduces you, you will say, "Please to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Glad to meet you. It's a pleasure meeting you. You know, uh, your conversation or your relationship with that person with whom you have been introduced continues based on the way you respond. Your response should be so warm." and you should not be cold. That is very important. It's a pleased to meet you. And usually, you know, you shake hands. Hi, and then you shake hands. That is very important. And again, when you shake hands, the way you, uh, that is a part of body language. When you shake hands, you should be very firm when you shake hands. That shows that you're confident, not give your hands, which is very drooping. That shows that you're very cold. And though it's very important to respond in the right way when you are being introduced. Now look at this small example on the uh, screen. Uh, when you introduce yourself, you'll say, my name is, I am so-and-so. Nice to meet you, I am so-and-so. Pleased to meet you, I am Sunil. Let me introduce myself, I am Smitha. I'd like to introduce myself, I am so-and-so. When you introduce the others, John, Please meet Nicholas. John, have you met Nicholas? I'd like to, I'd like you to meet Lisa. I'd like to uh, like to introduce you to Betty. Tom, this is Anna. Anna, this is Tom. This is the, these are the different ways in which you introduce others. And the responses will be nice to meet you, pleased to meet you, happy to meet you. How do you do? Now, there are certain tips when you introduce people, especially in business or formal context, sorry, context. Introductions are based on person's ranking or position. The highest ranking person is introduced to everyone first. Then, if you introduce two people of equal rank to each other, introduce the one who you know less well to the other, to the one who you know better, okay? Because there, he will not misunderstand. And the third one, if you have already been introduced you, uh, earlier, you don't presume that the person will know you. You always should reintroduce yourself. You can never say, oh, I've met you earlier. You know me, no? That's the usual style. No, don't do that. Don't presume that. But you say, I am so-and-so and reintroduce yourself. Now, when you have many names, example, I have three names, Doreen, Sneha, Lata, Kokia. If you want, when someone introduces you and you want to be uh, referred by your first name, then repeat the name with which you want to be introduced, uh, I mean, to be remembered. And so repeat it once or twice. And the other person will definitely know that you want to be referred as Doreen or, or, or as something else. Okay, so these are the tips that is, remember, in formal context, you should always introduce person based on his rank. Now, just a few examples. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shetty. So the other person will say, how do you do? I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom. I'm glad to meet you. Let me introduce you to Ravi Raj. The other person will say, pleased to meet you. Nice meeting you too. I'd like you to meet Sheila. Good to meet you. I've heard so much about you. This is Sam. Nice to meet you. Same here. Students see the example where uh, good, uh, the third, fourth example, I've heard so much about you. It's always very important. See, when your friend is 
introducing you to another friend, definitely this friend would have told a lot about you. And so it's always very encouraging to tell the other person that I've heard so much about you and that you're very important. So these are small things which we have to remember. Okay. And now we will go to the next part, next topic that is making a request. You know what's a request? When, you know, request is when you are asking help from someone. I'm requesting you to do something. And since we are asking uh, help, it is very important that we should be polite. As students, as youngsters, this is something which we have to learn. I always tell my students about the golden words, please, thank you. These are so important and sorry. This is so very important. When you ask somebody some help, it's very important to be polite. In college, example, in your college situation, you go to your college, go to your office, you want something. You will go and ask, give me that form. No. If you say, can you please give me that form? The person should just take the form and give it to you because the way you ask is so polite. He can never be rude to you. But as students, what do we do? We are so rash. We are so brash in our talking. Give me that book. That's not the way to say. There are many ways of making polite requests. And some of the very common ways are, could you please open the door for me? It's not the way, it's not the, uh, way to tell. Open that door? No. Could you please open that door? Would you mind opening the door for me, please? See that word, please, makes such a lot of difference. Even though the person will not be able, does not want to help you, will, he will definitely help you because you have been so polite to him. Can you open the door for me, please? When you travel by auto rickshaws, you will, uh, if, if, if the driver is going really very fast, you're scared, you'll say, Go slow, go slow. No. Can you go a little slow, please? Then he will know that you are a very sophisticated and cultured, mannered person. So he will listen to you. The way we express is very, very important. The most common expression for making a request is please. Requests are usually made in the form of questions. Can you please do this for me? You can, all, uh, you can add possibly to be even more polite. Could you, we, would pos we put possibly in between could you and the verb. Okay. Now there are some examples of the request. Can you show me a photo album, please? Will you lend me a book, please? Could you possibly show me the way to the post office, please? Would you help me with this exercise, please? Would you mind lending me your pen, please? What do we do you normally? Your friend is writing notes. You just, he, you, are, you want a pen immediately. You just pull out the pen from your friend and start writing. That is our usual way of doing. But you have to know requests are very important. May, it may be formal or informal. Now there is another thing. Asking and giving permission. Now this is another important thing which we as students should know, and we as responsible citizens and parents should teach our children. Children are very innocent. They will not know much. There is some ch um, uh, chocolate on the table. They will just see the chocolate, go grab it and eat it off. But it is your responsibility to teach the child or your student or, or someone younger to you to tell them to ask permission to take that. If we are responsible now, we will be responsible with greater things. There is something on the table. There is some money on the table. You will not feel like just grabbing it and taking it and going it away. So what do you do? You have to ask permission. Make the children also ask permission, even if it is a small thing. Can I use your pen, please? So even if you don't want to give the pen, you will give the pen. Can I sit here? Because most of the time, if you, are, you would have reserved a place for your friend, somebody comes and just grabs that chair and goes off. 
But if that person tells it in such a way, can I take your chair? Can I take this chair? You don't feel like saying, okay, I can't give you the chair. You can also say that, but many times the way you ask questions, you, the, you know, it is very important the way you ask questions. Is it okay if I sit here? Sometimes you go and just plop yourselves there. Is it okay? Can I ask you a question? May I use your computer? Many times people will not like that. They will not like to use their, and uh, they will not like to share their gadgets and especially expensive gadgets. But we are so insensitive that we go and grab their phone and just make a call. Give me a phone, I want to make a call. No, can I make a call please? That's the way. And especially when you come inside the class, you are late. May I come in please? You just walk, take your books, walk in. That is not the way. There are certain courtesies and there are certain ways in which we have to do our work. Can I take a look at your book? Do you mind if I turn down the TV for somebody at home? You know, you will be full blast watching TV. So even at home, you should go and ask someone who is watching TV, can I reduce the volume? Do you mind if I use your phone? Very important. Would you mind if I open the window because somebody would have closed it because he's feeling cold? And then you ask. Otherwise, there will be unnecessary friction. The other friend would have switched or, I mean, closed the window, but you go and open the window and then there will be a fight. Why did you open the window? Or things like that. So even before you do that, can, you, can I open the window? Would you mind? Do you mind if I open the window? If you don't mind, I'd like to smoke. This is in form, I mean, in not in classroom setting, definitely. I would wonder if I could borrow your car for a few days. Would it be all right if I borrow your phone to make a call? Now, these are important. They are asking for permission. Now, once you ask permission, the person responds and say, sure, sure, go ahead. No problem. Yes, you can. Fee please feel free. I don't mind. See, once these... Um, uh, permission, where once the permission is given, you also feel very confident about it. And you can do whatever you want. You can call, make a call, you can go ahead with whatever uh, help you take from that person. And therefore, giving a permission is also important. And these are the words, these are the phrases you use while you give permission. The next one, not always will you give permission. You can also refuse permission. But there are ways in which you can refuse. If someone says, I want something, no, I won't give it. That is being very rude. It's so important. Even when you refuse permission, you should be able to refuse it in a very nice way so that it does not hurt the other person. So what will you say? I'm afraid not. I'm afraid, but you can't. I'm sorry, but this is not possible. No, you cannot. You couldn't do that. Sorry. You're not permitted. Someone comes and tells you, come, we'll go and throw stones at the uh, windows. You cannot say, you cannot say, I can come, we'll do it. Sure, go ahead. You will, you will have to very uh, firmly tell. No, you cannot do that. Okay. So there are certain ways in which you can, um, these are the certain ways in which you can refuse permission. Now, there are some examples. Shut the window, will you? When you respond positively, you'll say, of course. But if you don't want to, if you, you cannot do it, you'll say, sorry, but it's a little difficult for me to reach there. Can you shut the window? Certainly. Yes, of course. You can also say no by saying, well, I'm afraid it is too high. I cannot reach it. Could you mind shutting the window right away? Well, the problem is, and then you can give a reason why you can't shut the window. Do you mind shutting the window? No, not at all. Of course not. Then if it's a, a negative response, you will say, sorry, but, and then you can give a reason. Would you mind shutting the window, please? You will say, in a minute, I'm sorry, I can't, because you can give a reason. I wonder if you could help me. You can say, sure, or you can say, I'm afraid, I can't. And then give an explanation. That will make it more appropriate. Now, the next one is offering help. 
the earlier one was requesting now we are offering help request is when you yourself are requesting somebody you are carrying a heavy load and then you are requesting someone to help you whereas offering help is someone will come and tell you you are doing something you are carrying a load the person cannot see you carrying that he himself will come and tell you can i help you that is offering help or you go and ask someone offering help i mean you are you are, you go and ask someone and uh, offer them help now you can use interrogatives interrogatives are questions when you ask when you offer help may i do something it's a very formal way of offering help in very official situation may i help you may i carry your bag for you may i offer you uh, offer you uh, my help this is a very formal way the next one would be would you like me to do something that's a little less formal but a very kind way of asking would you like me to open the window would you like me to bring you a drink would you like me to carry your bag okay and then again some more interrogatives can i do something it's a little less formal but still being very kind and warm can i bring you a dessert can i give you a lift okay it's not very formal but less formal do you want me to do something you are asking the person should say yes or no do you want me to come and pick you up you know at home in your family you will if your husband or a wife has to pick you up or your child has to pick you up do you want me to pick you up the child will ask they will not can i uh, they will not very may i help you and things like that they will not ask you they will directly ask you do you want me to pick you up that's being less formal shall i do something you can also say it's a very encouraging way to express your wish to assess someone someone is doing something shall i shall i turn off the radio shall i help you with your homework students it is very important in today's world that you should go and help others even without being asked and it is very important for you to learn these things in your house you have if you have little children your brothers or sisters your nieces or nephews teach them these things tell them to be sensitive about offering help to people who are in need these are very basic simple things but if you learn it now it will be a very it will go a long way in helping uh, others in future now there are affirmatives opposite of negatives you will just uh, or why, when you offer help you will go and say i i be happy to do something very formal way of offering help i'd be happy to reschedule the appointment i'd be happy to go with you this is very formal i can do something it's a kind of way to offer help to someone in both formal and informal that is interrogative and uh, affirmative forms i can write this email for you i can go and buy some coffee for you if you want i can help you with the load it's a very kind way of uh, expressing again let me do something it's a little informal way let me help you uh, with my with your jock- jacket let me find out if it's true the next one will i will do something it's a very informal way to offer aid with people you know who, uh, who you know and you will be happy to accept your help see for example you know that there are people who are in need you say i will help you don't worry i'll go shopping for you in spare people who are in need especially the during this lockdown time when you have older people older neighbors and they are so worried about so many things you'll say i'll go to the chemist don't worry i'll help you okay so these are the ways in which you offer help then uh, when you request help there are interrogatives okay the next one is requesting help would you mind it's the most polite way would you mind getting at the door for me getting the door for me that is opening the door for me would you mind helping me find my keys you know would you mind that is how it's a very formal way would you do something for me it's a little less formal would you help me carry this bag would you turn off your lights please okay the next one is again with questions could you do something 
if you want to make it more um, polite, then could you come, you can add possibly, could you come here, please? See, the word please is so important. Could you possibly show me where the nearest metro stop is, please? Or metro stop is? Do you do something? Do you, do you want me to go for, uh, for you? That is a less formal, that is less formal than the previous. Do you want me to come and pick you up? You're directly asking them. Okay, this is requesting help. You can also requ use question tags. You know what question tags are. One special way in English uh, of asking help or requesting help is a question tag. For this, you need to make a negative statement, not a positive, and then follow it with a question tag. Do you understand? First, make a negative statement, then do follow it with a question tag. The tag should be positive, you know. You couldn't tell me where the police station is. Could you? Couldn't tell me is negative. You will say, could you? That's the tag. And then to be polite, you can use could you or would you. That's very important. Could you or would you? They are more polite ways of expressing. The next one is accepting offers. Okay. When someone, uh, when someone is offering help or how do you respond to it? You will say, yes, please. You know, he will ask you, can I help you? You will say, yes, please. I'd like to, or I'd love to. Will you come to my college today? Or will you come to the restaurant today? I'd like to, I'd love to. Would you like to have a coffee? Oh, yes, please, I'd love to. Shall I take care of these files? But if you wouldn't mind, see, that's very polite. Would you like to have another piece of cake? Thank you. That would be very great. That would be great. Now, these are the uh, ways in which you accept offers. There are also ways in which you decline offers. There are times you really don't want any help. And how do you decline help? Sometimes many people with all their goodness will like to come and help you. But you don't want that help. So how would you say, no, I don't want, you can't say that. How do you would say, when you want to decline the offers without saying something rude, you'll say, no, I'll manage. You might, uh, you will say, uh, uh, would you like me, uh, would you like me to help you with this? But it's okay, I'll do it myself. Okay, when you are at a shopping mall, you're looking at something and this person comes and helps you and offers you help. Are you looking for something? Do you need it? Don't worry, I'll do it. Thank you. The simplest way to decline the offer is to say no, but then say no, thank you. That is very important. Students, many times you should also know to decline offers. It's not necessary that if anybody uh, offers you something, it's not necessary that you should always accept offers. There is also a very nice and very polite way of also declining the office. Now the last part is giving directions. Now this is a very, very important part. Now when uh, this giving directions is very important because we use this every day in our day-to-day -day life. Now, especially I can give you an example. I work in Hoskoti. Now if someone asks me, Madam, how do you come to your, how should I come to, give me directions to come to your college? Now, the most important thing I have to ask them is, from which direction are you coming? Because my college is on the highway to Kolar. Now, if the person calling me up and asking me, where is your college, is coming from Bangalore, my college will be on the right-hand side of the highway. But if the person is coming from Kolar, my college will be on the left side of the highway. Now, if I fail in giving this, asking these basic question, then it will be a total confusion. He can go and go to some other different village. So it is very important. Even you as students, you ask, you want to give directions. They'll say, Madam, where is your college? Immediately, the question you should ask is, where are you? From which side are you coming? Because if there is only one direction, that's fine. But if there are four or five ways in which you can come, then it's very important first to listen 
and then only give directions. Okay. And again, if you're in a new town and you want to know the direction and you want to know where the place is, you can, you are going, you're walking or you're in a car and then there is another person who is walking. You will not just go and say, where is the town hall? No. First, you should attract his attention and say, excuse me. Usually we say, hello. When you're driving and you want someone's walking, you call them and you say, hello. So immediately that person looks at you. So you take his, uh, you, uh, you uh, grab his attention. Say, excuse me, before you uh, ask a person. To make it sound like a question, you make your voice up, a uh, voice go up and say, on me. You say, excuse me. It's very important. Excuse me. And then he will look up. And then, excuse me. How do I get to the railway station, please? Now, again, you are asking a question. How do I get to the railway station, please? And then you will say, where is the nearest post office, please? Excuse me, I am looking for number six bus stop. These are the ways in which you can ask directions. Next one is giving directions. The person who helps you often says how near or far the place is. Students, it's very important to give the right directions. Now, a person who is coming to your place, he will come and he will ask you, where is this particular place? Now, if you do not know the difference between right and left, then it's a very big confusion. I always remember when we were kids, we used to come to Bangalore. And my father would always ask, where is this place? The people would be, you know, I don't know whether they used to do it purposely or whether they didn't know. They will say, right. And exactly opposite would the place be where we had to go and reach. Many times I have heard uh, we have gone through this difficulty. Therefore, you should be able to give the right directions. You will say it's about five minutes. It's about 100 meters from here. It's about 10 minutes walk. Okay, I can show you where it is. There are some people who are even so, uh, so uh, good that they will accompany you and tell you where the place is. Of course, in today's world, and today's uh, situation, you cannot ask anybody to come and uh, make you, uh, I mean, sit there, sit in your car and take them. But otherwise, there are people to even, there are auto drivers who will say, come, madam, follow. And so that is so much easier. Now, you should give specific their instructions. Students, this is very, very, very important. There are some, so look at these, uh, look at the screen and there are certain words which you have to use when you give the right extra, uh, directions. If you're helping, you, if you're uh, asking a driver, then you will have to ask him the right directions and he should be able to give you the right words. Turn right or turn left, that's okay. Go straight. Now, if there's a fork road there, where you, what do you do? You can say there's a fork road, there's a perpendicular road, you go straight till one particular point and then turn right. Go to the roundabout there and turn right. See, go straight on at the lights. Example here, when you come to the crossroad, take a left or take a right. You know, a crossroad, what it is. Um, when, when there are two roads which are meeting, crossroad. How do you go to that place? You should know to visualize that. And then go across the roundabout. You know what a roundabout is, uh, students? Uh, there is a, maybe there is a circle. You don't say circle. In, in our country, we say circle. But then there is a roundabout. You go straight, go roundabout. Go around that and then take a right. See, there are four roads and there's a, a circle. You have to take the right road. So go roundabout and then go right. You understand? That is roundabout. Take the first turning or first road or first street on your right. Turning is the right, uh, I mean, the road which goes right or go road which goes left. That is important. And then don't take, you will see, you will come, you will, uh, you will come to a bank. These are the words. You will, when you go, when you drive, you will see a park on the right side or you will see a lake on the right side. Then go around the lake. So these are the words where you have to be very, very clear when you give the instructions. 
then um, you know there are so many by lanes small roads first cross first a cross and so many things like that so what do you do don't take the first road because you will tend to get confused so if you are very clear in your instruction don't take the first road take the second road or take any one of those roads okay and then they will say go about go for about 2 minutes or go for 100 go uh, just about 100 meters and then take a right so it's very important you know when you drive they when they, they say you have to go for about 2 kilometers when you are in a totally new place you are so confused because there's so much traffic and all that so immediately you you check your speed i mean your uh, speedometer and you see how many more kilometers i have to go so to go for 10 km so you check now it is uh, 210 till 220 i'll have to go and then i can ask somebody else so this is important to give the right specific directions the next one very important while giving uh, directions is landmarks there are so many landmarks students uh, you know uh, nowadays we have the swiggy and dunzo and so many things when they call up they will ask you or um, you know Uh, cab services and all that when they call up they'll ask madam can you give some landmarks what is this landmark can there be uh, landmarks of places in your uh, area which is very which is known by everyone like you know there's a school near your house and then you can say you come to you ask anybody about the school they will tell you okay you can say there's a taxi rank or a taxi stand there's a level crossing you know level crossing is where the uh, road and railway meet you know that and you know the barriers go up and down so you cross the level level crossing or things like that you will ask such thing there's an underpass now this underpass is a very fair, a common thing in bangalore flyover underpass the road that, that goes one over the other you know that you know hebbal you go there's an underpass or uh, near um, Uh, Kaveri Theatre. You go. There's an underpass, okay, and there's a flyover. So you will say, don't take the flyover, but take the service road. Then go underneath. There's a tunnel. Go ra. Uh, there's an underpass. Go. Uh, go right. So this is the way you can explain this. Then there's a zebra cr crossing. You know what zebra crossing is? It's a black and white marking on the road where pedestrians have to cross. students we have to be very very sensitive to these things traffic lights pedestrian crossing all these mm -hmm. things you youngsters should teach the younger children because you know the sense of traffic traffic sense what people have in our place if you say there is pedestrian crossing they will not cross there they will cross in only places where you are not supposed to cross and again the signal lights red amber and green when there is red you have to stop there when there is amber then get ready only then when it is green you have to go ahead so these are important things which you have to learn traffic signals and then tunnel a road under a mountain or whatever under or through a mountain crossroads you know junction we use this word junction you go to that junction and take a left there go to the junction and take a right there okay fork in the road fork is very important fork is a y road okay because that's a very confusing you will always say go as the road goes and suddenly you see one go road going left then you realize oh my god which is the road i have to take and you're right in the middle of traffic and once you uh, where once you cross uh, that road then you realize oh i should have taken the other road so it's very important you have to ask the directions and just don't go ahead ask listen then there's a turning the main road a lane by lane small lane whatever okay and then also they you have the uh, uh, in the lane uh, when i talk about lane you have the bus lane you have the auto lane you have the pedestrian lane cycling lanes in foreign countries so you have to be very clear about which lane you have to take the speed limits and all that so therefore you have to uh, when you give instructions you will tell all these things and then use of prepositions see uh, students see the second there second picture there round about see there's a circle and then the vehicles go round about that is important please remember what round about is now use of prepositions for dire of directions go past it's important 
continue past something so that is now behind you you have to pass that go across cross you go across the road see you see a junction and then you say you cross over or go across go along is continue along the road go straight on means don't turn left or right go up is walk up or drive up the hill see there's a road which goes up and goes down bangalore won't have roads like that but when you have uh, in the north there are roads which go up and it's very obvious it's steep and there's one road which will go down so you will say go up the road go down the road pass through something get, go out of it see in again there are highways where you have exit points in highways or here in railway stations also so you will say go out of it you are going on a highway then you say exit take the exit at the first play take the first exit and get then get into the city okay it's front in front of you you can see it you you will say see the building is right in front of you it is opposite the bank it's on the corner you know where the two roads meet uh, maybe at a right 90% angle okay and now finally i'm coming to the end of the whole thing a typical conversation when you ask for directions you will say excuse me i'm looking for the post office so the other person will say okay go straight on and then turn left at crossroads it's about 10 minutes uh, 100 meters to your left you can't miss it and then you say thanks the other person will say you're welcome and here there are some more um, on your screen there are some more um, um, phrases how do i get to the library is there a pet shop there where is the nearest post office do you know where the shopping center is and uh, so on and then could you could you help me please i'm looking for the bank looking for a bank can you tell me i can okay uh, that part i can't see properly anyway go straight ahead there are traffic lights and then continue straight keep going turn left turn right take a right and these are all the words which will help you to give the right directions and this is all i have to talk about directions and communicating with people thank you i hope i have made some sense thank you so much yes uh, thank you dorin madam it was a very exhaustive session you had to cover so many things and you have done it very wonderfully there are some questions uh, a student asks what is the difference between can and you can and can and you what is the context i mean i mean you... uh, she uh, she tells what is the difference if i ask a question can i help you hmm. or if i ask the question may i help you is there any difference between is can and yeah and may you? yeah may is more formal and more polite hmm. when you compare can and uh, may may is more polite and it's a modal which is used and so may i help you is you are you are uh, being very more i mean you are being very polite in asking such a question may i help mm -hmm. you can i help you you can you can help that is a little less formal okay. as it was very clear uh, there aren't many questions yes on behalf of the management members of vvn degree college ca and a principal faculty members i express my gratitude to professor dorin snehalata kotian for accepting our request to be the resource person and also 
I express my appreciation for all the efforts that she has put in in preparing PPT on so many topics which you have uh, capsuled, which she has capsuled it very wonderfully. I thank all the participants and teachers also who are watching this program live. Uh, before we wind up, I would like to give instructions to the participants and also some um, questions which they have asked. I would like to respond now. That is, many of the uh, students and even teachers uh, did not get a chance to register as the registration uh, went beyond 6,000, we blocked it. And mm -hmm. now they are asking, can they register? Yes, you can. What you have to do is watch this program live every day. You don't need any link for this. You have to just go to YouTube at 11 o'clock and on the search bar, you have to type BBN Degree College and you can watch this program live. Every day at 1.10 in the chat box and on the registered participants WhatsApp group and even the email, uh, you would find link to give your feedback and also answer the questions for the tests. And these questions will be based on today's two sessions. So if you, even though you have not registered, if you answer these questions, automatically you get registered. And if you score above 50% of marks, you would be getting a part completion course certificate. And if you are not able to score 50% marks, yet you will get E certificate of participation. So thank you. Thank you all the faculty members, participants who are watching this program live. Stay at home, take care and stay blessed always. Thank you. Thank you one and all.